he didn't have too far to fall. <laughs> <laughs> True that. Blessing of those little toddlers, right? They run, 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 they fall. They're only falling a couple inches, really. <laughs> oh my goodness. I've got a problem with too many papers up here this morning. Now, I'm wondering, did I send this to you? Did you send it to me? Or have I only sent it to myself? Have <laughs> you ever been in that predicament with files you're sending? Uh -huh. <laughs> Someone once said, you don't need anger management. You need people to stop irritating you. <laughs> <laughs> your people skills are just fine. It's your tolerance for idiots that needs work. <laughs> There's some truth in that. Um... Every day driving, I see people do things that are just not, not very bright, not very mm -hmm. smart. Here's a couple more of those local ordinances about the Sabbath. Uh, a local ordinance in Snow Hill, Alabama, prohibits fishermen from chewing tobacco on Sunday without the written permission of their local physician. Um, all citizens of Baghdad, Florida, are outlawed from dipping snuff while on the grounds of any local church. Neither are they allowed to smoke a pipe or a cigar on the Sabbath. Nothing is mentioned about cigarettes, however. There's a loophole in that law. Mm. Hmm. They are in tobacco country. Message today is entitled Advocate. Advocate, based on John 15 and 16. Would you pray with me? O oh Lord our God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of every heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. God, you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Jesus must have been a confusing person to listen to, but he did not intend to be such. Have you ever listened to someone that made no sense to you? We listen to them, and they seem like they are talking nonsense. Here's a poem that I want to read for you. You might recognize it. It's a, a favorite of mine, but it's written originally by Lewis Carroll. "'Twas brillig in the slithy toes did gyre and gibble in the way. All mimsy were the horror groves, and the momraths outbrave. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jub-jub bird, and shun the frumiest Bandersnatch. He took his warble sword in hand, long time the magsum foe he sought, so rested he by the tum tum tree, and stood a while in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the tuggly wood, and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the warble blade went snicker snack. He left it dead, and with his head he went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the Jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O oh, fragious day, kalu kale, he chortled in his joy. Twas brillig in the slithy toes, did gyre and gibble in the way. All mimsy were the borogroves, and the moan rats outbreak. <laughs> well, can we understand it? Does it make any sense? The lyrics are fun and weird, and they put our minds to work just trying to puzzle it all out. Here's another poem by Robert Haas, a living poet. It's on the failure of Buffalo to levitate. You're going to understand he's had some fun with this. Miller Fillmore died here. His round body is weighted by marble angels. He lies among the great orators of the Iroquois. Paint does not arrest the trade book houses in their elegant decay. They peel like lizards in the dying avenues of elm. Gentle enough, night drifts above the yellow burst of aspen in the park. Something innocent and reptilian suffers here. Cumbrously, the souls of the wives of robber barons are imprisoned in the chandeliers. Hmm. Do we get the sense of that? <laughs> Can we understand it fully? I think Jesus was talking in ways that were unclear to the people. You know, he spoke in parables. 
He told stories. He said things that were not understood by the majority of people. Often, he had to take the disciples aside later on and fill them in, <clears throat> try to make it plain. In our text of today, we get a portion of that time of prayer and teaching just before he was going to leave the earth. First in death, and then in resurrection, and then, of course, the ascension to heaven. Jesus was talking to them in simple terms, but still they were learning about the Holy Spirit in a new manner. And he is doing his very best to give them understanding about this Spirit who will soon visit them. Notice that the first verse he says, I will send you the Advocate, the Spirit of Truth. And that word in Greek is parakletos, it means helper or advocate. An advocate is one who stands up for another person. You can have an advocate in court stand up for you to help represent you, to help you understand the case, help you understand and help the judge to understand. One who comes alongside you. And here Jesus indicates that he will be the one sending this helper, this parakletos, to the disciples. He is not only a helper, capital H, but he is called the Spirit of Truth. Significant that it is not God doing the sending, but Jesus Christ. He is the one moving the Holy Spirit to descend upon the earth and indeed upon all these disciples. When will this happen? That must have been at the forefront of their minds. Jesus must go. No, say it ain't so. But unless he goes, the Spirit will not come. So this is critical. He is telling them he must go in order for the Spirit to come. As far as I can understand, Jesus ascended back to the Father, and then it was ten days before Pentecost. Ten days before the Spirit came down and landed on the gathered believers. Happy birthday, church! Jesus is sending the Spirit, but He will come from the Father. Okay? And He will testify about Jesus. And then they, those disciples, will testify. Why? Because they were with Jesus from the very beginning. They know everything that has been going on. They were eyewitnesses to all that Jesus did and said, and that's powerful, that they experience it and share it. And there is one key phrase where Jesus explains the work of this wonderful counselor, this parakletos, this helper, this advocate. He will have three key roles to fulfill once he arrives. Verse 8. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. Very succinctly does Jesus say what this Holy Spirit, this Holy Helper will accomplish once he arrives. It will be not just a one-time work, but an ongoing work, an ongoing ministry that even sweeps upon us. Firstly, this Helper will convict the world of its sin. And the chief sin is this, verse 9, it refuses to believe in me. That's right. The first thing that they or we refuse to believe in Jesus that applied back then, it still applies strongly today. We all know the old say, saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make, make it drink. drink. Right? We can't make him drink. In my life right now, it's like this. I can take the dog out, but I can't make him do his business. <laughs> <laughs> She's at an age where she just goes when she... She's ready to go, and it, often it's in the house. The other morning it was like a trail from the door into the kitchen, and I didn't see it in time. Yeah. That was how my morning started, cleaning off my shoes. Well, the same is true of the church. We can lead a person to church. We can invite them to church. We can speak to them about Jesus. We cannot make them believe. I say that we are always one generation away from losing faith completely. No one is grandfathered or grandmothered into the faith. Each generation must decide for themselves. 
We can do all that we can, and we should do all that we can to bring people to saving faith in Christ. It begins with prayer, seeking the guidance of the, the Helper, the Parakletos, the Holy Spirit. Pray, pray, pray for the non-believers that you know. Pray that he would bring conviction on their hearts. Secondly, righteousness. Righteousness. Jesus says, because he is going to the Father, the Spirit will be bringing conviction of God's righteousness. What does that even look like? Is there any doubt in your mind that God is righteous and his decisions are righteous? Do you remember when Abraham bargained with God over the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah? Genesis 18, if you want to look it up. God wanted to destroy them for their evil, but Abraham kept countering to say, Hey, what if we had 50 righteous? Will you desist, God? If we found 40, and he got them down all the way to 10 righteous persons, could there be 10 righteous people in the city? He got God to agree not to destroy it if there were even 10 righteous, upright people. But alas, there was only one righteous man that God identified. That was Lot, Abram's nephew. Same thing happened when Noah lived in Genesis 6. God decided to wipe out the people who were evil and thought about evil all the time. In fact, if you read it, it seems like God is saying, I regret creating humankind. Because they're so wicked. So he flooded the earth. Oh, all except Noah and his family who were saved on that ship that they built, spent a hundred years building. But this destruction would not keep happening because God realized that, yes, people are not righteous. We would always fall short. Thus, he sent his son to earth to redeem us all. And part of that redemption is through the work of the Holy Spirit upon us. He convicts us. He reminds us. He teaches us. Teaches about a righteous God. Psalm 14, 1 through 3 says this, Only fools say in their heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and their actions are evil. Not one of them does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the entire human race. He looks to see if anyone is truly wise, if anyone seeks God. But no, all have turned away. All have become corrupt. No one does good, not a single one. You might say, hey, that was then. That was the Old Testament. Well, Paul picks up the theme when he says in Romans 3, For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in the past. <clears throat> I think what it means is this. We are a hopeless bunch, aren't we? Mm. And God had to send first his only son, then the Holy Spirit to earth to work with us to save us. To bring us closer to God. To purify our hearts before God. Thirdly, the spirit of truth will tell us of coming judgment. That we will all be facing death. And decisions will come. You can read the book of Revelation or the book of Daniel or the other prophets. We can read from Paul who reminds us that we will see God face to face one day. Now... Everything we see in a glass darkly. And this was a time before they made mirrors like they do now. The mirrors today are pretty accurate. Back then they were not so accurate. Think about a polished piece of metal. Highly polished. But look in it and what do you see? It's a little hard. I wouldn't dare shave looking in a piece of polished metal. <laughs> but on that day, on that day we will meet him face to face. All will become clear then. We will be changed. We will be new creations in a new kingdom of God. 
Jesus says, He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. Verses 14 and 15. Do you see the chain there? All that God knows and is, is given unto the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior. He is relaying all of this to the Holy Spirit, who then imparts this to us, to the disciples first, and to all who believe, and to you and me. Hallelujah! Amen. All right, that was pretty pathetic. Hallelujah! <laughs> hallelujah! I hope that's a good hallelujah. <laughs> Imagine their joy as the Spirit descended and fell upon them. And they could share the gospel with anyone and everyone. Visitors in the city were able to hear the word in their own language. Have you noticed that if you are out traveling, and you could be in a big crowd, you could be in the mall, you could be somewhere, lots of noise around you, but if someone says your name, it catches your ear. Your ears perk up, and immediately you're looking around. Who said my name? Who knows me? You hear your name being said, and you notice it right away. The same, same thing happened here, but they did not hear their own language all over the city. And suddenly the Spirit descended, and they were able to communicate like never before. When we receive the Holy Spirit and listen to Him, we give honor and glory to Jesus. Right? And that's powerful. He's the one that deserves the honor and the glory. One final thing to notice is how Jesus parceled out information to the disciples. He did not overload them. He gave them what he felt they could handle, little by little. He did this all through his whole ministry. He gave them little bits of information, and sometimes they felt overwhelmed. Maybe most of the time, they felt overwhelmed. We can learn from this. I used to work for a farmer, and he said, do not give cows all the hay in the barn all at one time. You feed them a little bit at a time. The same is true for us. Don't eat more than you can chew. Take small bites of the Word of God and hide them in your heart. Memorize them. Spend some time memorizing Scripture. And with the paraclates help, we will be reminded of what we need when the time comes that we need. Amen? Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit, the Advocate of God, came down and changed the world. He changed our lives for the better. He comes to convict and to show God's righteousness and to reveal the inner thoughts of Jesus' own heart. Think about that. He reveals the inner thoughts of Jesus. And we have access. Wow. Happy birthday, church. Let us celebrate the goodness of God this day. Pray with me. Dear Lord, as those disciples receive the spirit of truth, help us to hear the spirit and to abide by his words. Let us give glory and Honor to the Father and the Son and through the Holy Spirit, our Advocate. In God we pray all of this, Father and Jesus and Holy Spirit.